Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. You are our living hope. We have hope in you, Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your one and only son for us. And in you, we have hope. In you, we find forgiveness. In you, we have relationship. So, Father, we thank you for your love displayed on the cross. We thank you for your love in your ever-present uh, presence with us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you comfort and you guide and you make known the path in front of us. Lord, we long for more of you. God, we hunger for more of your presence. Lord, that you would this morning would fan into flame a fresh passion for your presence, oh God where we would pursue you with everything that we have and follow you as you lead, that you would be pleased with our obedience, with our hunger, with our longing for you. God, we pray, Lord, as we get ready to go into your word. God, I pray that you'd anoint my lips this morning to preach your word, that you would anoint... Our minds, Father, that we might understand your word. Anoint our ears that we would hear it. And our hearts that we would receive it and apply it. Jesus, have your way here today. As we go into your word, may it transform us a little more into your liking. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Matt, worship team. <clears throat> there is something about cheesy Hallmark movies, cheesy TV family movies that reluctantly, I will confess, I enjoy. I like sitting and watching something I can predict all the way through because, well, those cheesy Hallmark movies and family movies, well, it seems like they're always the same. The, the plot, the storyline seems to be so similar, especially, for instance, this way. If the movie is set in a small town, in a country town, and it's set outside of Christmas, so let's get the Christmas ones out of the way, but it's set in those, those summertime, springtime, falltime seasons, if it is set in any one of those seasons, you can almost guarantee that at some point during the movie, there is going to be a country fair. And at the country fair, there is going to be a few things that you will see that I, I, in all the fairs I've gone to, I haven't seen them all in a real fair, but I see them in every movie. Things like the pie baking contest, the pie eating contest, things like the bobbing for apples. Whoever thought that was a good idea? Fill a barrel full of water, dump a bunch of apples in there, and have random people open their mouth, stick their head in the water, try to get an apple, and come up and backwash it all into that water. I'm grateful that those seasons are only on the movies. And then some of the other competitions you see in these, these, these Hallmark or, or family movies, you'll see the potato sack race. I'm yet to see a potato sack race at a, a, a town's fall fair. Maybe it's because of the liability aspect, because we all enjoy watching a good potato sack race as they're going down, and someone inevitably will do a face plant. Anybody else guilty of watching these videos online and laughing at other people's failures? But then there's the three-legged race. The good old three-legged race. One of my favorites to watch in these movies. 
because you have the over-competitive big person who gets tied up to this little person and their legs get lashed together and the, the, the starting pistol goes off and they go running and inevitably at some point in the race, the child falls over and is getting drugged along by the over-competitive father who just wants to win. I feel like I can relate. At the expense of my children, I think I would do the same. Drag them through the grass, letting their face be filled with dirt just so I could win. There's just something about a three-legged race. They get tied together so that the intention is that they would work together or not. But most definitely, if they are tied together, they know for certain the presence of the other person. You can't be tied to someone else and not know that they are there. And in the race, they're intended to work together. This morning, I want to talk about presence this morning. Not presents that are under the Christmas tree, presents. And more importantly, the presence of God. I'm not going to focus and put a lot of time on the omnipresent aspect of God, although that is absolutely amazing and mind-blowing when you begin to study and look into the Word and realize that God is everywhere at all times. Isn't that incredible just to think about that right now as we are here in church, there are churches all throughout our time zone that are still meeting at this exact same time. And God's presence is here just as as much as he is there. That there are some churches out west where the pastor right now is in the sanctuary before anybody else arrives because it's really early in the morning and he is in prayer right now that there's some pastor somewhere interceding for his church and the presence of God is filling that place there just as much as he is here Today, we serve an omnipresent God, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the manifest presence of God, the the made known presence of God, those moments that are just different from the others where you know that you know that you know he's here. Ever have one of those moments? Aren't they, aren't they, uh, they, they're, they're, they're addictive when you, when you encounter the manifest presence of God, you just want more. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now we can just take that one passage, that one verse, and read it outside of the entirety of the account of what took place. Be like, okay, yeah, sure. But pause. Look at what it says. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. It's not, it's not figuratively speaking here. The place that they were meeting was shaken. Can you imagine going to a prayer meeting? And at the end of the prayer meeting, we're done now. After the prayer has happened, the place is physically shaken. God manifests his presence in that room and in that moment in such a way that the supernatural affected the natural. And the place that they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God boldly. What took place? It was a group of people who were in love with Jesus. It was a group of people who were so passionate for his presence that they lingered in prayer. And when the Holy Spirit filled that room, there was a refilling because those who were in that room, for the majority, were already a part of the upper room experience. When Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter two, they were already filled and baptized with Holy Spirit. They were already speaking in tongues and speaking boldly and doing things that they could not do in their natural ability. But here, they've gathered again and they're refilled with power from on high. Here we see people who might not have been there who are baptized with Holy Spirit just the same because it says that they were all, say all, not just some, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Here we see those who had already encountered the power of God having a fresh encounter. Oh, that we who have encountered the manifest presence of God would hunger and long for a fresh encounter. Every time we gather together at church, every time we get together as believers, it is another opportunity for us to encounter the manifest presence of God. That, (coughs) that should put a passion within our pursuit. (coughs) This, this evening that they had, was different from their regular evening bedtime snack before they go down kind of night. It was different from just a a simple now I lay me down to sleep moment of prayer. This was an encounter with the actual manifest made known presence of God. Kind of like what's seen in John chapter 14. Jesus is talking to his disciples. This is before the crucifixion. This is, this is before crucifixion and resurrection. This, this, this is leading into it. He's comforting his disciples. He's letting them know what's about to come, even though they didn't fully grasp it at the moment. He's talking to them, and he tells them these words. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Any parent feel the same feelings. Right, you're looking at your child. If you love me, you'll just listen to me. Here, Jesus is saying the same thing with a little less frustration, I think. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. The world, they can't accept him. They can't see him. They don't know him. They don't realize he's there. See, omnipresence of God means he is everywhere at all times, whether you feel it or you don't. You can be in this room right now and not recognize that someone else is here. Anybody ever go to church? I do. And I, the next, that week, I call someone up. I'm like, man, I missed you at church. And they're a little offended. I was there. Oh. You're in the room, but I didn't recognize your presence. Tell me I'm not the only one who does that. Right? Because when you have a room filled with people, it's hard to recognize every single person that is there. You can be in the room and not sense their presence. God is in the room. And at times, people don't, ex- don't sense His presence. He's there but not noticed. He's there but not recognized. Jesus goes on and he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Did you catch that? Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him, get this, and show myself to him. There is a direct correlation Uh, that you will see over and over again as you read through the scriptures. There is a direct correlation between the manifest, made known presence of God and the love for God shown in obedience to God. Let me say that again. There is a direct correlation between the manifest, made known presence of God and the love for God shown through obedience to God to God, that's when we encounter his presence like never before. But those moments where we encounter his presence, they change us. They transform us. When you encounter his manifest presence, it's like taking an egg in the morning, heating up that cast iron frying pan, getting some butter in there, and cracking that egg over top of that searing hot iron 
soon as the egg touches it, it's transformed. You can't put that egg back to its original state any longer. It is completely changed. I will eat the egg out of the frying pan, but not out of the shell. Because that's just nasty. It's changed when you do that. When you encounter the presence of God, it transforms us just a little bit. You can't go back to normal after you've been in supernatural moments. You can't go back to the humdrum after you you experience what God can do in a supernatural encounter. Every time we encounter his made known presence, it should change our lives just a little. Moses' face was changed when he met with God on the mountain. David's joy was ignited with dancing when he encountered the manifest presence of God as the ark was coming back to the city. The list goes on and on and on of how people were transformed when they came into the presence of God. Therefore, the presence of God should be something that we pursue with everything we have. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with all unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. What is this saying? The more we encounter his manifest presence, the more he takes us from glory to glory to glory. The more we encounter his presence, the more he transforms us more into his likeness each and every day time. It is a transformation process that begins and continues. See, once you've tasted it, once you've experienced it, it it, it gets in you and you just want more. Like butter chicken. Once you taste it, mm, you walk into a room, a house, and you smell butter chicken. You're like, "Mm, I had that before. I want it again. Like KFC. The way it was in 1990s. See, I moved down to Alabama in 1999, and when I was down there, um, they had a KFC with an all you can eat lunch buffet. (laughs) In that first year, I put on 30 pounds. Because when you walk by it, when you're going down the street, I'm not going to go there today. I'm just going to go down the road and get a salad. Ooh, I just want a little more. It just smells good. I had it yesterday, but it's the same thing with the presence of God. The more you taste it, the more you want it. The more you experience his manifest presence, the more you desire to get back in it because it changes you. Because it's better than absolutely anything you've ever had. You can't go from supernatural back to normal and just stay there. Once you've experienced the supernatural, if you just go back to the natural and hang out there for the rest of your life, it brings about a bitterness and a grumpiness, which is why probably some in churches are dangerous to be around, because they've tasted once before. They've experienced him at one point. They saw some things at one moment, but it's been a while. It's been a minute or two. And what's happening in their grumpiness, what we need to realize is that their spirit is crying out for a fresh encounter with the manifest presence of God, yet their mind says, been there, done that, and that's not how it happened the first time. So I don't know, can I tell you that there is no preset formula to entering into the manifest presence of God? There's no one, two, three to getting there, except, except for love shown through obedience. The one who loves me and obeys my commands, he's the one who loves me and I will show myself to him. Love him, display it through obedience to him, and it brings you to encounters with him. Psalm chapter 24, we've been hitting it so often throughout this year already. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may dwell in his presence? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who can encounter the manifest presence of God? Those with clean hands 
and a pure heart. His manifest presence is found through love displayed through obedience. So now let's look at Psalm 84. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Psalm 84. When you got it, say, "Mm mm-hmm, I got it. Okay. Here we go. Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Are you catching the the colorful language that is being used here? It is not a laid back psalm. This is not a, hmm, let's just take this one passively. No, 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 no. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty, exclamation mark, said with passion. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Have you ever desired something that much where your soul yearned for it? Where you felt like you were going to faint if you didn't get it? Husbands, you're supposed to say yes and look at your wives. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place Near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Whoa, hold up. What's going here? As you pass through the valley of Baca, as you pass through the dry areas in life, as you go through the valleys that don't typically have a lot of life springing out from it, what does it say? You, say me, you Make it a place of springs and autumn rains also cover it with pools. Can I tell you something? You can bring, you can bring the rain in the dry places. You can bring, you can bring the blessings of God wherever you go. You as a presence dweller, you as a presence seeker, you as someone who seeks to be in his presence every single day, you can bring the rain because he is in you. You can bring and usher the presence of God, the blessings from God with you wherever you go, when, when you walk with him. When you follow him, when you trust and obey in him, you break that trust and obedience, the blessings don't follow. You break that trust and obedience and you step out of line for a while, you can't expect to be walking in his favor at that moment. But you step back in and you trust and obey, his favor follows you every single day. What does it say in Psalm chapter one? He who dwells on his law, who meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of living water whose fruit, it comes out, whose leaf does not wither. You bring God's blessing. Wherever you go, when you walk with him and trust and obey him, the manifest presence of God is found through love displayed through obedience. This journey that we are on as Christians, this journey that you and I are on is an adventure that can be tracked as a pursuit for his presence. Want to find out where the Christians have been? Follow the tracks, and the tracks are that of pursuing his presence, seeking out his manifest presence in their lives on a regular basis. It is a passion for presence because his presence brings joy. How many like joy? If you don't like joy, something wrong with you. We need to talk. His presence brings joy. His presence brings celebration. How many like celebrating things? Again, if you don't, there's something wrong with you. We need to talk. 
His presence brings joy. His presence brings celebration. His presence brings blessing. His presence is worth the pursuit. Absolutely, hands down, once you've tasted his supernatural manifest presence, it is revealed to you, it is worth the pursuit. Sin is not worth missing out on his presence for. I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how good it tastes. I don't care how how wealthy it might make you. Sin is not worth missing out on his presence because his presence is everything to me. See, when we try to accomplish anything in our lives on our own, outside of the presence of God, it just doesn't work out quite the same. Anyone else testify to that? But when we bring his presence into it, when the presence of God is in it, on it, all around it, the blessings of God, the peace of God, the shalom of God, the nothing missing, nothing broken factor of God can be all around and about your life when you're walking in his presence. We as a church, we as believers, we need to be fueling, we need to be fanning this passion for his presence. Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. That's the main text for us this morning. I just got the introduction out of the way. Now we understand we're looking at at something that's passionate, and we're looking at his presence. So here we are in Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised you on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hizzites, the Prizites, the Hivites, the Jezubites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. And then the people heard this distressing words. They began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So that parent looking at the child, go to your room while we figure out what the punishment's going to be. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can I tell you there's a few things we're going to learn about his presence this morning. Number one, his presence calls us to follow. His presence calls us to follow. When he begins to to manifest himself in our midst, he gives us direction and things we need to do. Here, as Moses is at the base camp of Mount Sinai, at this base camp, remember, some really cool things took place. God met with Moses there. The commandments were given. Good things happened there, but so did bad. The golden calf took place there. The plague for a punishment took place there. But can I tell you that the bad didn't erase the good that had happened? When you mess up in life, your bad doesn't erase the good that God has done. Your bad doesn't erase the cross. You can't out sin the grace that was poured out on the cross. You can run from it and deny it and end up in a place you don't want to be. But every time you mess up, his grace is there. Every time you, you, you fall and find yourself in the mud, his grace is still there. He still loves you. You can't do nothing to make him love you any less. Just like you can't do anything to make him love you anymore. He loves you. And he desires to be with you. And his love from the cross calls us to follow However, Mount Sinai was never meant to be a permanent dwelling. It was never meant for Moses and the Israelites to set up a city there. 
It was, it was an encounter moment. It was a moment where, where Moses had an encounter with God on the mountain. It was a moment where supernatural took place and the stone tablets were engraved by the finger of God and he came down with the, the Ten Commandments. It was a supernatural moment, but it was never meant to be a dwelling place. Base camp was not the promised land. They were intended to be on a journey towards the promised land. Can I tell you, when God does something in you, he's often looking for a way that he can also do it through you. When God does something in your spirit, when God does something in your life, he is looking to also do that same thing through you. The things that I have been through, that God has taken me through, the things that he has healed in my life, the things that he has restored in my life, the things that he has shown me in my life, he has used them to impact others for the kingdom. The same goes for you. When Moses met with God, he came down and spoke to the people. When Peter was empowered in the upper room, he went out and spoke to the crowd. When he was filled again with the Spirit of God, he went to the, to the, t- the gate of the temple and he healed the beggar. Saul was blinded in the natural, in the presence of Jesus, so that he could see in the Spirit. So what did he do? He helped so many, and he still does help people to see in the Spirit what God has for them. Can I ask you, what has God done in your life that he wants to do through you? What has he done in you that he desires to do through you? See, what happens at the altar What happens at the altar is not meant to stay at the altar. Yes, we do respond to altar calls. We come to the altar and and we lay down things. We we say, God, I'm not doing this anymore. God, would you forgive me? And those things that we take off and lay down, those burdens, those things, that we leave at the altar. But what I'm talking about is when you come to the altar and you encounter the manifest presence of God and he does something in you, what he does in you was never meant to be left at the altar. What he does in you, he desires for you to take with you so he can do it through you. The journey means going somewhere, means follow me, means we are on a move. Following him means going from glory to glory to glory. In 2 Corinthians, as we already read, he he transforms us into his likeness with ever, say ever, you're with me, increasing, say increasing, Now put the two together, ever increasing, with ever increasing, not increase for a moment and leave it on a shelf. No, with an ever increasing measure, that means he is bringing us somewhere and we got to keep in step with him. But to camp out where his glory was means to miss where his glory is. If they had stayed at the foot of the mountain and never kept walking, they wouldn't have experienced the promised land. When God does something in our lives and we encounter his manifest presence in our lives, if we just stay there and not move forward with it, we miss out on the next revelation that he desires to show because he's a revealing God. We take it and we walk with it. But to camp out where his glory was means the opportunity to miss out on where his glory is. And I don't know about you, but my soul yearns, even faints, for the presence of my God. I want to be where he is always. If I were to take my kids, I apologize to both of you that we have not once this year gone and done a boil up a boil up is where I typically every year try to take my kids out into the woods in the winter. And we go out, we snowshoe somewhere, we light a fire, we have a lunch, we boil the kettle, we have some fun, we tell some stories. If I were to do that with my kids and show them a unique place in the wilderness and for them to enjoy it and us to have some fun, tell some stories, and for me to teach them a little bit and, and we just have a good food, and we have a good fellowship. If I were to do that with them there and then say, hey, Let's go somewhere else. I want to show you another place and leave that place. But they stay by the smoldering fire. Eventually, they're going to recognize that I'm not there anymore. 
Eventually, they're going to recognize the fire has gone out. And even though we, have, we, we, we had fun here, Daddy's not here anymore. He's gone somewhere else. When God does something in our lives here and ignites a fire in our hearts at the altar, and he says, I want you to now take that and follow me where I go. If we just stay here and not follow him, eventually that fire is going to smolder out. And we'll realize that, wait a second, I haven't been walking in obedience. and I'm not in his presence anymore. It takes a step of faith. I'm not making it light. It takes a step of faith to use what God has done in you and to let him do it through you. It takes a moment of vulnerability where we say, okay, God, you did that in me, and you want me to go talk to that person about it. You did that in me, and you want me to go pray out loud for them. You did that in me, and you want me to step out and walk with you. It takes a step of faith to walk in his timing. That's where we find the people in Exodus 33, verse 1. Go, follow my directions. The presence of God calls us to follow his leading and his directing. But it's hard at times, isn't it? God ever called you to do something? He's put on your heart, hey, I want you to go talk to that person. I want you to do this. Has God ever put something on your heart for you to do that you were like, "Uh uh-uh, come on now. Where it was fearful, where it literally shook you to your core, you're like, I don't know. It's hard at times. The what-ifs begin to fill our minds. The fear of the unknown is real. I don't know what's there. Can I tell you something about the unknown? When God is leading you into the unknown, there's one known thing you can know about the unknown. The one thing you can know about the unknown when God is leading you to it is God will be there too. That's where his presence will be. Ever take a kid or a teenager to a lake where there's a cliff and you know how deep the water is below, and it's safe to do so, and you encourage them to climb up the cliff, get to the top, and jump off. And then you get the kid who gets up there, and he's looking and like, a thousand other people have done it in front of them. They know that it is safe, yet they get to the edge, and it's like, and you're like, it's going to be so much fun. Jump. It's okay. I didn't really have to deal with that growing up. We pulled up to the cliff when Jameson was only three, No, four. And before I knew it, as I'm trying to coax Isabella to get into the water, he has now jumped out of the boat and is swimming to the cliff. He sees some teenagers he's never met before climbing up this cliff and jumping off. So here Christina is, Mark, Jameson. I'm like, what? Isabella, you got, oh. I jump out of the water, into the boat, into the water. I swim to shore. By the time I get to shore, he's already making his way up the cliff. I'm like, how is this four-year-old doing this? And I'm trying to get up as fast as I can. By the time I get to the top, he's right there. And I reach out, and he's already gone. You know when you jump off something, your, your, your stomach comes up into your chest? I didn't jump, but my heart was like coming out of my mouth as I'm watching James. And go, oh, I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Isabella sees it happen. She sees him come up out of the water, and he's all good, and he had fun. He's laughing. He wants to do it again. I'm like, oh, Lord, help us. Yet she gets to the top, like every other student I've ever had, gets there, and she's like, uh, uh, uh. it's going to be so much fun. Just take a step. Well, I don't know. How deep is it? Hey, I'm bigger than you. I jumped off. I'm alive. Good. You didn't laugh at that one. And they stand there, and it's this stubbornness comes over them. Trust me, if you take this step of faith and jump off this cliff, it will be like nothing you've ever experienced before, and it will fill you with joy. Yet the stubbornness of the unknown (laughs) overtakes us. It's kind of like what was taking place here. Go up to the land, flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Because you are stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. The stubbornness of the kid on the cliff, not trusting and not willing to jump. 
It's kind of like what we see taking place here, but what's taking place here is so much worse. When God says, you stiff-necked people, that would, be hurt, that would be hurtful to hear, wouldn't it? It would be hard to digest those words if God spoke those to you, you stiff-necked people. But what's he getting at when he says this? The stiff-necked comment goes beyond just the fear of the unknown. See, what God was trying to do was to be yoked with his people. He, he, he was trying to make it so that they could be yoked with him. Now, I'm not talking about the eggs again. That analogy is done. The yoke that we're talking about here is what you put around to, to, to oxen. They, they put them around their necks so they can pull and work together. And God is desiring in this point to be yoked together with his people that they could accomplish some powerful things. But their necks were too stiff to bow into the yoke of obedience, into the yoke of his law. They were unwilling on trusting to obey him. They were unwilling to be pure and holy. Their necks were too stiff. But then verse four happens. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. Can I tell you the second thing? His presence convicts us to change. When you encounter his presence, it calls us to follow, but it convicts us to change. See, pride, rebellion, willful disobedience shuts down the manifest presence of God. Yet a passion for his presence drives us towards obedience. When you have a true passion for the presence of God, that is what drives you to want to live a pure, holy, righteous life. Because we just want more of him. See, when you've had him heal your body, you realize that his presence is better than anything else. When you've had him, his presence, heal your mind, you realize that his presence is better than anything else. When you've had him heal your relationships, you realize that his presence is better than anything else. When you've had him set you free from addictions, you realize his presence is better than anything else. When you've had him give your dirty, old, messed up self that new car smell, you realize his presence is better than anything else. It's the passion for presence that drives us to obedience. So okay, when Jesus says, follow me, whether it means going somewhere or staying somewhere and doing something, both mean taking a step of faith, taking a step of trust, John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me, who loves me, he who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. Love displayed through obedience ushers in the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God comes when we maintain obedience in our lives. Keep going in Exodus Chapter 33, verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. And anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Verse 11, jump down. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. We need to cling to the presence. We need to linger in his presence. Kind of like that kid being dropped off to day, daycare or to kindergarten. When the parent tries to drop them off, the kid latches onto the leg of the parent. And as the parent's trying to walk away, they're trying to shake the kid off their leg. No, 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 no. We need to be like that kid latching on to the parent's leg when it comes to the presence of God. Joshua did not want to leave 
because he was lingering in his presence. He was just waiting until everything was done. As long as the cloud remained, Joshua was in the tent. Even after God spoke to Moses and Moses would leave to tell the people, Joshua stayed behind just in case God would say one more thing. Just in case God would reveal one more thing. Where are the presence lingerers anymore? Where are the ones just waiting for the lights to go out after a move of God, just in case God says one more thing? Oh, that we would hunger him like Joshua, especially when we feel depleted. Anyone ever get tired? I'm grateful for warning signs. Those little notifications that come up on your phone, batteries at 20%, red light comes on, you're like, ah. Oh. You know you got to go charge your phone. When I'm, when I'm sitting somewhere and I'm using my phone to hotspot for my computer so I can, I can be writing a message or, or studying, and as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden this notification comes up on my screen. Mark's phone is at 20%, disconnecting. Ah, i got to quickly find some power and plug it in. I get those notifications, but when it comes to power tools, you can be out there running that impactor, driving, dri- driving screws all day long in a deck, and all of a sudden you'd be halfway through one screw and thump, done. Where that battery just goes right up until it's done. And at that moment, you realize with low batteries, you can do nothing. That you either got to get that thing on charge or go get yourself a new battery. You can't do much work for the kingdom of God with low spiritual batteries. The presence of God charges us up for work. The presence of God recharges our spiritual batteries. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, "I I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, Teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, then Moses said to him, if, say if, you're with me, if your presence does not go with us, Do not send us up from here. Moses knew where his strength came from. Moses knew where his spiritual uh, batteries were recharged. And that was in the manifest presence of God. And he cries out to him, God, if you're not going to be in it, please don't send me to it. If you're not going to go there, I don't want to go either. I want to be with you. If you don't go, Don't send us. It's the desire to be in his presence, following him, walking with him, being with him. It's realizing that his tent is portable. In verse 7, it said, Moses pitched a tent. Can I tell you that the presence of God is portable? It goes with you wherever you go as long as you stay in step with him. God, I just want more of your presence. God, I just want more of you in my life. God, I want to I want to dwell on your word so that I might be transformed from glory to glory to glory so I can represent you, so I can expand your kingdom, so I can do the work that you've called me to do. But it starts with fanning that passion for his presence. This morning, God might be calling you to follow him today. You might be here this morning and you have not yet made that decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. You've thought about it, you've toyed with it, but you're going, hmm, I don't know. Can I tell you this morning that his presence is calling you to follow? He wants relationship with you. He wants to lead your life. Would you choose to follow him? Maybe you've walked away from him. Maybe you you chose to follow him at one point, but you've stopped following. This morning, his presence is saying, I want you to pursue me 
again. This morning, his presence might be convicting you this morning. He might be calling you to change. You might be feeling, hey, I'm not worthy. There's something going on. Can I tell you that that thumping you feel in your heart, that is the manifest presence of God going, I want to bring the change. You just got to let me. He'll bring the change. You might be here and you might be feeling tired, empty, drained. Can I tell you, his presence is here this morning. His presence is here today and he is desiring to fill you up, to recharge you, to make you able to walk and follow after him. So would you do me a favor? Would you stand your feet? Father, we just stop right now and we recognize your presence in this room. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here and we are grateful for your presence in this room today. God, I ask that you would fan into flame a passion for your presence here today. So Lord, if there be change that's needed in our hearts, would you bring that to light right now? If our batteries have been depleted and we're feeling empty and drained and weak, would you bring that to light right now? And may we encounter your presence here today. Oh, I want your presence in my life here today if that's you we're not going to call you to the front this morning if that's you and you hunger for his presence just right now in your own place begin to call out for him we're not done yet but God would you just fill me with your presence would you surround me with your presence God I need to encounter you today I need healing I need restoration God, I need to be changed. I need to be set free. God, I I need to be filled up and charged up again because I'm weak and tired. Lord, would you fill this place? Just begin to call out to him right now. Fill us, Lord. Fill us with your presence. In Jesus' name.